Hello, everyone, and uh, thanks for joining our webinar on GDPR and contact centers. So, uh, firstly, uh, just to introduce myself, I'm Oli Noxkoivisto. I'm the CEO of Leadesk, and I'm going to be uh, talking about uh, the GDPR uh, and what it uh, means for call centers and contact centers. So, we'll be going through what you need to know and what you need to do. So, uh, firstly, for the agenda, uh, we'll first just briefly go through the uh, GDPR registration, what it means, uh, when it's going to be in place, and uh, what's the background. Uh, then we'll discuss a few common challenges uh, that every one, one of us has to uh, tackle, uh, such as the data protection officer, so the DPO in short. Uh, then uh, we will discuss uh, the documentation requirements set by the GDPR. And uh, lastly, we will then uh, go through consumer rights uh, that the GDPR brings uh, or then enforces uh, when it comes into force. And lastly, uh, we will go through very briefly how uh, Leaddesk can help. Okay, so firstly, what is GDPR? Firstly, GDPR stands for General Data Protection Regulation. It is basically uh, the regulation that governs how EU citizens' data can be handled. There are a lot of uh, local data protection laws in Europe, and they differ on country-by-country -country basis. So GDPR is meant to replace all these individual country laws. Uh, and to bring in a harmonized uh, registration to cover all countries and to uh, have the same same laws in all the EU countries. And just to uh, also note that this also does apply to any uh, parties outside Europe that operate with uh, the data of EU citizens. So even if you have a contact center in outside the EU, uh, but you still process data, uh, of EU citizens, then you must comply with GDPR. So basically an EU regulation uh, is something that becomes law automatically without the member states having to do anything. So uh, in practice, this means that uh, when it's uh, going to be enforced on the May 25th next year, it's going to be enforced in all the countries at the same time. Uh, as I said, it's going to replace the old registration. It's quite similar to uh, to the current German registration, actually, uh, and it has very uh, sim big similarities to all the other other countries' registration as well. Uh, but the thing that it mostly changes is that things are shank sanctioned uh, quite harshly. So uh, if you do not comply with GDPR, uh, you can face uh, significant sanctions. And just to be clear, we are not a law firm. Uh, we've uh, put a lot of time and effort into investigating GDPR, and we followed it uh, for three, four years while it's been uh, been processed in the EU and when the uh, when it was uh, just becoming law. Uh, but uh, when you do need some details. Uh, very particular details. It's best you turn to uh, then to uh, your uh, experts, local experts. Uh, then, lastly, uh, just so we know what we are talking about, uh, personal data. Uh, what is that? Uh, it's basically any information uh, from which you can identify a person. So, if you have uh, a list of phone numbers, that is. Uh, our personal registry and personal data, since you can identify who who is behind this phone number. The same applies to any information where you can uh, track an individual. Lastly, uh, GDPR uh, is uh, just about the personal data part. It's not about then if you uh, uh, it's not uh, uh, for example a law on direct marketing. Uh, this is something that gets mixed up uh, very often. There is another piece of registration that has not yet been approved, 
and to our best of knowledge, uh, most likely will not be approved uh, in any time uh, in the near future, uh, or it might be that it will be buried forever. And this other law is called e-privacy. It was supposed to come to law on the same day with GDPR, uh, but this uh, seems to be not so. And if uh, e-privacy would come into law, that would uh, directly regulate, for example, direct marketing and uh, outbound calling, for example. But uh, to, to the best of our knowledge, it's not uh, moving forward and it's uh, most likely going to be uh, postponed until uh, quite, quite some time in the future. Okay, so uh, firstly, uh, there's been a lot of talk of this uh, GDPR and a lot of uh, scaremongering and uh, uh, un unwarranted, maybe even scare marketing. But firstly, just don't panic. Uh, GDPR, most of the things have already been into the in law. Uh, it's just the fact that uh, now they are uh, sanctioned uh, more strictly. So. GDPR is not going to revolutionize the contact center industry. Uh, it's going to make things clearer, uh, and it's also going to affect uh, some parts uh, of the work, but it's not going to be a, a big, big game changer. Okay, so what are the common challenges then? As I mentioned, uh, firstly, uh, let's discuss the data protection officer. Do you need one? Secondly, let's discuss uh, what you need to document and how. And then thirdly, uh, let's uh, go through the consumer rights and how, how to uh, tackle these uh, rights. So the data protection officer, who needs one? Okay, firstly, uh, let's go through why there is such a thing as a data protection officer in the law. Basically, uh, the, why, why there's a, a person uh, dedicated with this job uh, is that uh, the EU saw that uh, without an individual, uh, individual body inside the companies uh, whose uh, responsibility it is to see that the data, uh, data protection is complied with, uh, there is a big chance of uh, of the management of the company uh, uh, then maybe making uh, business decisions on uh, whether or not some parts of the GDPR should be uh, should be handled in a certain way, and that is why there's uh, uh, this data protection officer who has uh, basically immunity, so you cannot fire a data protection officer. Uh, he's the, one of the last people to leave, uh, leave if, they are, uh, if people are let go. Uh, so it's an individual body uh, inside a company whose uh, duty it is to see that the GDPR is uh, followed. So basically, the tasks are to inform and advise all the staff and train the staff. So basically train everybody uh, on the processes and practices that are in place. Also, their responsibility is to uh, bring more awareness to the data protection side of things, monitor co compliance with the GDPR across the company, provide advice, and also then be the contact person uh, to the supervisory authorities, uh, which are typically called the ombudsman. Uh, so an ombudsman is the governmental uh, the the uh, authority inside the government that is uh, watching after after data protection, and uh, also act as a contact point both inside the company and outside the company. Okay. Uh, now, lastly, do you need one? So this is the uh, question that uh, has been uh, talked about a lot. And the reason for this is that uh, during the preparation of this uh, registration, uh, it used to be so that uh, companies above a certain threshold of employees 
must have a data protection officer. But may, let me be absolutely clear, this did not come into law. So uh, in the final draft and in the uh, past registration and in the article 37 there, uh, it states that uh, there are four reasons to have a, a DPO. Firstly, all public authorities must have one. Next to none of our customers are public authorities, so if you are not a public authority, then you, uh, this doesn't apply to you. Secondly, if you uh, do regular systematic monitoring of data subjects on a large scale. So if you regularly and systematically monitor data subjects on a large scale. This is something our customers, to our best of knowledge, very rarely do. This would apply, for example, uh, if you provided a mobile application that would, for example, uh, monitor the location of its users. So there would be regular systematic monitoring. If you have, uh, if you are basically having one or two calls uh, with somebody, that is not regular and systematic monitoring. And this monitoring is the important part. This is not monitoring. It's something the other party is actively involved in. If you are talking to the customer, uh, it's not monitoring. It's basically then uh, a transaction. So this uh, this does not apply to. Uh, most of our customers at least. Okay, thirdly, companies who process on a large scale any special category of personal data, like political opinions, religious beliefs, or ethnic origin. So basically, if you hold in your databases any data that could be uh, used for discrimination. So uh, things, think about it this way, things that uh, uh, in no EU country uh, you can ask in an employee interview. So uh, those are the discriminatory uh, criteria typically. Some of our customers might have this data, but uh, I would estimate that uh, more than 90% of our customers don't. And lastly, uh, then if you do have uh, data on criminal convictions or offenses, then you must have a data protection officer. Leaddesk has decided to uh, have a data protection officer, uh, not because of these requirements, uh, but due to the fact that we take uh, security and compliance very uh, seriously. And that is why we've uh, chosen to elect one, but uh, it, is not, it would have not been something that we had to do. Of course, you might have some local regulation that uh, dictates otherwise. Uh, but then it's not under the GDPR. Okay, then uh, documentation. So uh, there's uh, quite a few documents and things you have to think about under the GDPR. Uh, firstly, uh, you should uh, uh, document your data handling process. So where do you get data? What do you do with that data? And when, where do you send data? You should also define what kind of uh, storage do you use for it, uh, how long do you store it for, and what is your retention policy. So basically, how do you uh, how do you uh, do you keep it for two years and then you let go of it, or what is your uh, take on that? Uh, what data you should erase? How do you erase it? And also then, what data do you need to communicate? to uh, your customers and to your third parties uh, in case they ask for uh, for this documentation uh, or description of your processing activities or their own data. We're going to be providing you with uh, or our customers with templates uh, and examples on this documentation during the first two months next year. So you have ample time then to prepare your documentation. Thirdly, uh, secondly, sorry, uh, you should train your agents. So the agents who act in the, with the customers, uh, EU is going to be doing a lot of marketing on this GDPR in May. So most likely there are going to be requests. So you should train your agents uh, to 
to answer the questions they uh, most likely get. So for example, where did you uh, get this, uh, my number? Where did you get my details? Uh, please send me my data. Please erase my data, uh, and so on and so forth. So you should really train your agents and just write them a script that this is what you should do, this is what you should answer. And thirdly then, uh, you should audit your supply chain. And what this means is that under the GDPR, it's not uh, only you who are responsible for what you do, it's also that you are responsible for where you get the data and where you pass on the data. That you, you if, even if you comply with GDPR, if down or upstream of you, uh, there are bodies that don't, you are also responsible for them. This is not a big hassle. Basically, it's about communication with your suppliers and with your customers that, hey, this is the case, uh, there's this registration, uh, have you thought about it? Uh, and just go, go through that you have the comfort that uh, everybody's doing their part. And of course, then also maybe think about the communication flow and the security there. So uh, if you are sending uh, sending uh, Excels over email unencrypted now, uh, maybe you should think about other ways of doing that and so on. Okay, uh, then lastly on the common challenges. So they are basically there's uh, there's uh, two rights, uh, and there are some business challenges related to this uh, that uh, are the most important. So uh, consumers under the GDPR have uh, the two major rights, uh, I would say. Uh, they have other rights, but these are the two major ones that affect you the most. They have the right to access and the right to erasure. So this right to access basically means that uh, consumers have a right to know how their data is processed, what is it processed for, how it is secured, uh, what is the lawful uh, reason for this, and uh, then also they have the uh, right to get their data in an easily transferred format. So basically they, they should be able to somehow get their own data free of charge uh, easily in a uh, format that they can easily use. Okay, and then there's this right of erasure. So this is many times confused with a uh, right to be forgotten, uh, which is basically the marketing term used for it uh, in many cases. And this is something that actually uh, is not the same thing. So the right to erasure and the right to be forgotten are not the same things. So uh, under this right, the consumer can request the removal of their personal data from your databases and from your data banks. But what it actually means is that you must uh, delete then all data that is not uh, necessary for your uh, business and for your rights. So uh, let me take an example. So if, if uh, you would call a consumer, in an outbound campaign, and the other side would get, the consumer would get upset, and they would say that, never call me again, and erase all my data. Okay, so there's the first thing. So if you erase all their data, how can you make sure that you won't, will never call them again? So it's clear that you must store, uh, for example, their phone number, in order to then uh, not call them again. The other thing is that, uh, okay, so they ask you to erase their data. So what, what about then? If they then, uh, after this call, call uh, the ombudsman or the police and do a complaint on you. And you get a request from the officials asking you for what data do you store of this data subject? Why did you call him? How many times did you call him? Uh, and so on and so forth. So clearly there is a lot of data uh, that must be kept. So you can provide an audit log uh, and you can provide a, a, a truthful story that why, where did you get the data? Why did, was it handled? How was it handled? And so on. 
So this is uh, a very uh, important distinction. Okay, uh, so this also then uh, translates into the business challenges of uh, so that you must be able to ensure that the data can be accessible so easily that uh, you can comply with the re requests uh, for the uh, access to the data. You also must be uh, certain that uh, your agents know how to uh, comply with these requests. You must also define what data should be erased uh, in the case that there's a request and also then uh, have a business process uh, for uh, then uh, answering uh, questions from third parties such as the uh, ombudsman. So how can lead desk help? Uh, the one thing that was uh, left out of the, all these uh, challenges was actually uh, the data security part. There are strict requirements of, uh, for data security. Uh, so basically physical security and logical security, uh, so software and hardware. Uh, but here, uh, rest assured, we've been audited by Bureau Veritas uh, for 20, ISO 27001 and by KPMG on SOC 3 uh, for years now. So uh, nobody can ask you of more. So basically, we are not saying that we do things like ISO 27000. We are ISO 27000 and SOC 3 compliant and have been for years. And the biggest auditing company in the world, Bureau Veritas, has audited us. And KPMG, uh, the, one of the biggest uh, auditing companies in, uh, in the world, uh, has also audited us. So nobody can ask you uh, on the system side. You can trust us. Nobody can ask you. Uh, for a better compliance on that side. Okay, secondly, we can help you with the documentation. So we'll be uh, sending documentation over in uh, uh, some templates and examples in, the, uh, uh, in February. So you can then comply and you have ample time there. Also, we'll be rolling out a set of tools. Uh, you can see one here on the right, uh, for example, uh, on getting and comply, helping you to comply with the data requests. So basically this tool will make it easy for you to uh, export the consumer's data uh, in a secured uh, package uh, for you to then send even uh, over email. And then uh, for free, you should think about uh, how you can unify the uh, processes so that uh, the data flows Flows, uh, flows are such that you can easily document them. Uh, for example, if you are working with product owners, so maybe then consider uh, uh, giving uh, product owner access, for example, to your eDesk account, uh, so that you can you don't have to be sending sending uh, personal data over email. Thanks a lot, everybody. Uh, we'll uh, end the webinar now and. Uh, We'll be sending over the materials uh, a little bit later today. Uh, and then uh, if you ha do have any uh, questions, please don't hesitate to be in contact. We're happy to help.